Okay, all right. So, um, we get things going here. Last lecture, uh, we looked at, we began our exploration of Ornithischian dinosaurs, and we started with, you know, what is an Ornithischian? What are the traits they have in common? We looked at the Heterodontosaurids, this early branch of small-bodied Ornithischians, and I spent most of the time looking at Thyreophora, the armored dinosaurs, Stegosaurs and Kylosaurs, and their early kin. So today we're moving over to another of the big clades of Ornithischians, the Ornithopods, um, and as well as the lineage leading up to both the Ornithopods and the group we'll, co we'll cover on Wednesday, which are the ridge-headed dinosaurs, the marginus salients. So this name, Ornithopoda, the ornitho in there is the same as an Ornithischia or Ornithology, it means bird, podos, foot, so the bird-footed ones. Uh, it's sort of an ironic name because their feet are not particularly much like birds. Uh, there are specialized Cretaceous forms that have a three-toed foot, but it doesn't have that backwards pointing toe that makes a bird foot a bird foot. And there's another group for which bird foot would have been a much better name. It's the group to which birds belong. But sadly, that's not how the uh, taxonomy went. Uh, now, Traditionally, and by traditionally here, I mean basically from the 1980s onward, there was this um, conception of ornithopoda as consisting of sort of three groups, two grades, two you know, paraphyletic series, and then one clade. And these were, uh, respectively, the small primitive forms, what we used to call hypsilophodonts, named after one of the genus, one of the genera in there, hypsilophodon. And then larger, more advanced forms, the iguanodonts, named after, not a surprise, iguanodon itself, and then the highly specialized duckbills, or hadrosaurids, which, as it turns out, are nested inside iguanodonts, which are nested inside hypsilophodonts. However, prior to the 1980s, this name, ornithopoda, was applied far more broadly to types of dinosaurs. Because prior to the 1980s, there wasn't a cladistic conception, a phylogenetic conception of ornithopoda, or indeed pretty much anything in dinosauria. And instead, that word was used for essentially any ornithischian that wasn't lucky enough to be a stegosaur or an ankylosaur or what we will call on um, uh, Wednesday a neoceratopsian, a frilled member of the horned dinosaur group. So all of these things on the screen here, not shown to scale, um, were once considered ornithopods. But as we get into the 70s, uh, and new specimens are being studied of some of these forms, we begin to lose some of these forms out of ornithopoda. So these two guys who drop out here, the dome-headed dinosaurs, the pachycephalosaurs, and the early members of the horned dinosaur group, were recognized as not being ornithopods. We'll talk about them on Wednesday. Those are the groups we talked about on Wednesday. Then, when the first cladistic studies came along, we eliminated the small-bodied bipedal thyreophorans from Ornithopoda, things like Scutellosaurus. And additionally, the most basal members of Ornithischia recognized at the time, things like Lacedosaurus, um, they were seen to be ornithischians that branched off before the thyreophorin marginocephalian ornithopod group. Okay, so this gets us up to the end of the 20th century. In the dawn of the 21st century, we began to recognize that heterodontosaurids weren't ornithopods. For a long time, they were still part of ornithopoda, even in early cladistic studies. It turns out there are a lot of skull similarities between heterodontosaurids and true ornithopods, but those turn out to be convergences. Okay, so now we're into the 21st century, and we begin to recognize that there are a handful of members of ornithischia which are closer to ornithopods and to marginocephalians than to everything else, but are outside either of those two groups. So that guy goes away. And then for a while there, that there were creatures that uh, are particularly important late in dinosaur history that had traditionally been considered hips hypsilophodont ornithopods that seemed to lie outside marginocephalia plus ornithopoda, 
And up through a couple of years ago, um, I, I excluded these guys from Orthopoda based on the latest studies, things like Fesculosaurus. And in fact, that Hypsilophodon itself, the form that gave the Hypsilophodon grade its name, fell outside the Ornithopod marginocephalian groups for a handful of studies in the 20 teens. And so we had an extremely reduced Ornithopoda. And so I was, you know, we were risking the chance that Ornithopoda was basically, uh, you know, well, basically it was just what we call Iguanodontia these days. Now, the latest set of studies actually have restored a couple of these groups back into Ornithopoda. So it's a little bigger than it was in the most reduced form. But, as one might imagine from this countdown, what is or isn't an ornithopod isn't clear, and there isn't really super strong character, that is, trait evidence, that demonstrates what ornithopoda is. Some really good trait evidence for subgroups within ornithopoda, but depending on the studies, some of these early, unadorned, relatively primitive, small-bodied forms sometimes pop into it and sometimes pop out of it. Well, what's an ornithopod anyway? Ornithopoda is basically the hadrosaurids and everything closer to them than to the horned dinosaurs. So, many of the forms that were down here and that are over here were once included in Ornithopoda, but they are no longer. And just to give you a sense of what some of the forms in this part of the tree look like, here they are. So I should point out there's this clay neornithischia. You don't need to know its traits or anything, but it's the ornithopods, the margin of cephalians, and everything closer to them than to thyreophorans. And they look the, sort of the standard generic configuration of what we think an ornithopod was, which was a bipedal ornithischian. Uh, doesn't have armor, doesn't have frills, doesn't have horns. And so what else are you going to do with it? You put it in an ornithopoda. These guys are small-bodied forms from the Jurassic, um, shown in the case of uh, Hexinlusaurus here. Life size, actually, even, even that's a little bigger than life size. Small guys, little rabbit-like dinosaurs in its own way. Uh, this is a particularly important one from this part of the tree, discovered recently, Colindodromius. And actually, before I talk about why it's important, I'm going to take advantage of the position that this mounted skeleton is in. And this gives us a sense of why opis the puby, why having backwards pointing pubis, pubies really increases your guts, your gut volume. Because take a look at this. If the pubies had been pointing forwards, the gut volume would be constrained to here. But by pulling them backwards, that really does increase that volume, but keeps the center of mass right around the hips. Now, Calinodromius is not an interesting dinosaur, generally, in terms of its skeletal anatomy. Uh, it's very generic. What's interesting is we have these skin and feather impressions of it, or fuzz impressions. And indeed, it is covered both by combinations of scales and complex structures as well as simple fuzz. And it is one of our best evidence, uh, as, long, as well as the, um, the heterodontosaur Chanyu, Chanyu Long uh, in demonstrating that uh, some primitive ornithischians were fuzzy. So here's Ornithopoda as it exists now. So we've got sister group, margin of cephalia. We'll be talking about these guys on Wednesday. So we're going to be marching up this part of the tree. And it's interesting to note, well, it's interesting to some of us, that when we look at these basal branches, that most of them are only known from the early Cretaceous onward, that there's a lot of missing history here. You know, we look at this part of the tree, the Iguanodontian part of the tree, and it matches their first appearance in time, matches pretty well with their position on the family tree. But there's a lot of missing information down here. There's a few early ornithopods which go back to the middle and late Jurassic, but a lot of these lineages were predicting that there are members of those groups that extend further back in time, and either we have bits and pieces of them and we don't recognize them properly, or maybe they were living in environments that we don't uh, have sampled well yet, or maybe the phylogeny is wrong. Wouldn't be crazy. We've seen it, uh, been, uh, we've seen other alternatives before. Okay, so here's a cladogram of Ornithopoda. I've got a list of a few features that actually do unite Ornithopods here, but don't worry about them. We're not going to deal with them in any great degree. Just want to say that they do have traits 
that in some phylogeny show uh, that those groups do form a clade relative to all others. Just published a couple of years ago is this critter, Changmiania, uh, uh, known for many excellent articulated skeletons. Um, we can see some of those along here. This is a, an early Cretaceous form from China. Hang on, early, early. Let me back up here. Yes, early. And it's given us a lot of details of anatomy to show what an early ornithopod is. And in fact, uh, it comes out as the most basal branch of ornithopoda in the studies that have been shown on it so far. That said, I know, I don't know its name yet, I don't know the details of it. I know that there is an old, a, a earliest late Jurassic small bipedal ornithischian on its way. It's been being described for several years now, uh, publications I've out on it yet, which will hopefully give us even more information about the base of that part of the tree. And there are other forms better known. Nanosaurus, not a very creative name, but it gets the point across. Uh, little dinosaur. A little reptile, known for a long time, uh, known under multiple names as well. So there were other small-bodied ornithischians called Othnelia and Othneliosaurus and Drinker that have all been at one point or other considered their own distinct form. But in the latest round of studies, it looks like they're all just Nanosaurus. And then we get a little further up the tree. We get branches uh, of slightly larger forms. Some of these up to about two meters long or so. So uh, two meters, uh, six and a half feet. Cretaceous only at present. And one of these branches, the Orodromines, represented by Eryptodromius on the top there, is actually known to be a group of burrowing dinosaurs. The first group of uh, Mesozoic dinosaurs known to have excavated their own burrows. And by burrows, I don't mean just any hole in the ground. I mean a hole in the ground big enough to go into. And here are some of the burrows of Eryptodromius. So first discovered out in the American West, but we have found burrows of Eryptodromians in Australia and you know, people looking for them elsewhere. And not only are they burrows, there's actually the bones of babies that have been found inside of them. So we've long considered sort of this phase of dinosaur evolution. I've, I've personally called it in this class since the 1990s, sort of the bunnies of the Cretaceous. The idea is being that they're small-bodied, relatively fast, but not super speedsters, and probably survived by living in a lot of numbers and turning over the population really quickly. Um, but they're also bunny-like, at least for erectodromines, by living in burrows and keeping their babies in there. And so here are a couple different uh, drawings or paintings showing that sort of model. Here's sort of an old version, uh, perfectly scaly, and you know, a more modern one, um, with the, under the possibility that these forms may have had fuzz as well, something that's still not definitely known for most types of dinosaurs. Uh, let's show some other forms from this part of the tree. Uh, and you see that they're all really super generic. Uh, it's not a, it's, it is for that reason, the lack of really spectacular adaptations that this whole phase of dinosaur evolution has been sort of hard to uh, nail down in terms of its anatomy. Here's Hypsilophodon itself, known since the 1800s, one of the first small-bodied dinosaurs discovered and the first small-bodied uh, ornithischian discovered uh, from Great Britain. And Thescalosaurus here, which is a relatively common dinosaur from the very end of the age of dinosaurs in Western North America. Um, and it shows that this sort of body plan survives pretty well, you know, first appears in the things of this general form in the middle Jurassic, in the case of basal Neornithischians, and last ones are around when the rock drops. So uh, what can we say about this lifestyle? As I mentioned, um, they, their primary de defenses seem to have been speed and numbers. They don't show that numerous high-speed adaptations we'll get to eventually in some of the carnivorous dinosaurs, but as far as herbivorous dinosaurs go, they probably were pretty swift and agile. As I mentioned, it's within this group that we have the only good evidence so far of burrowing dinosaurs outside of birds. There are some burrowing birds, just putting that out. And like stegosaurs, they have sort of pointy snouts, and that strongly suggests that they were picky feeders, that they were very choosy 
about the types of food that they eat. So that's the Hypsilophodont grade ornithopods. ornithopods. There is no formal Hypsilophodontia anymore. Back in the day, these would all have been put in a paraphyletic group, or some people even consider it monophyletic, called Hypsilophodontia. We don't recognize that anymore, so that's why the name is in quotes. Okay, so moving up, we get to this clade here, Iguanodontia. And in contrast to the forms down here, and the various steps along the way for which the, the differences are subtle and ambiguous and extremely unlikely to show up on quizzes or exams. Just throwing that out there. We get up here and there are some traits that become really distinctive and recognizable and likely to show up on homeworks and exams. Okay, so Iguanodontia. Uh, this is basically everything closer to Iguanodon than Hypsilophodon. This group has a good record starting in the Middle Jurassic all the way up to the end of the Cretaceous. By and large, Iguanodonts were bigger than the earlier types of, of ornithopods. The biggest of the earlier, earlier ornithopods are in the festival of Sorids and Hypsilophodon itself, you know, forms in sort of the two to four meter range, in the case of some of the biggest festival of Sorids. Uh, Iguanodonts, there are some small forms, but the majority of them are quite large. Like all the ornithopods I've talked about so far, the early branches start off as obligate bipeds. So they started off carrying that tradition uh, that dinosaur, dinosauria had at its base. They had become bipeds and walking, around, walking and running around on their hind legs. But within Iguanodontia, with larger body size, we'll have a trend towards more quadrupedality but in a new way, so far, most of the quadrupeds we've encountered have been obligate quadrupeds. That is, they can only walk around on their hind legs. They might have been able to rear up to feed higher up, but for the most part, they just live on all fours. What we're going to see in Iguanodontia is what we call facultative bipeds. Some people call them facultative quadrupeds, um, meaning basically the same thing. Animals that can walk on both their hind legs or on all fours. There aren't too many good examples of that in the world today. I mean, there are some species of pangolin that do that, but most people aren't really too familiar with pangolins. Bears somewhat, but bears don't habitually walk very far on their hind legs. They can stand on their hind legs and threaten you. They can walk somewhat, but they don't do it for longer distances. These are animals that may have been able to walk on all fours or run around on just their hind legs. And during the Cretaceous period in particular, Iguanodonts were a really important part of the, uh, of the herbivorous community. So what are some Iguanodontian traits? Well, one thing, the premaxilla is now toothless. Earlier, so earlier ornithopods and other ornithischians typically had teeth in the premaxilla. But in Iguanodonts, the teeth are all gone. And the premaxilla is itself now a beak. And Although I didn't highlight this, note that the predentary is also quite big in these guys. So they have a beaky front, uh, upper jaw front end and a beaky lower jaw front end. Also, relative to earlier ornithopods, the nares, the part of the skull that's the opening for the nasal passage, has become enlarged. Now, we have already seen once the elaboration of the nasal passage in dinosaur history, and that's in Ankylosauria in general and Ankylosauridae in particular. We're now going to see this elaboration in Iguanodontia taken to its extreme in some of the ductiles. And just throwing this out there, we will see in most groups of dinosaurs from now on, when they get big, they get more elaborate narial regions, nasal chambers. Why? All together now, we'll talk about it in the third section of the course. Uh, it has to do with physiology, probably. Basically, it's going to have to do with uh, dumping heat. Okay, now, a trait which in the cladograms comes out at the base of Iguanodontia, but will quickly be lost, because that's the way evolution happens, 
is that they typically have maxillary teeth, so teeth in the maxilla, which are wider than tall. But that's not going to last long. When we get to one of the major subgroups, it's going to reverse that. But I just want to show there are actually traits that support this relationship. There's plenty others as well. Now, in orthopod history in general, and especially in Iguanodontia, we get this elaboration of the jaws and what looks like a new form of joint. So I've already talked about how ornithischians in general, by having the two mandibles meeting at that single predatory bone and able to pivot back and forth to aid in chewing, in many of the ornithopods, especially in the Guadalajara, it appears that there is a joint formed with the lower part of the face relative to the rest of the skull that allows that to pivot outwards as well. And that gives an increased grinding action at the teeth. That said, there are other motions going on as well. So there's that joint surface, or that joint orientation there. And so the lower, the jaws close, the lower jaw can move back and forth, the upper jaw can move back and forth against it and increase the grinding that goes on. So just showing some of the early branches of the guanodontia, I know they're not dramatically different anatomically from the hypsilophodont grade. Some of them are quite small. Um, these things still obligate bipeds. It looks like there's a, <coughs> excuse me, there's actually a major plate of Gondwanan, which means southern hemisphere dinosaurs within this. Um, but they're not all from down there. Uh, here's a somewhat better known one from North America in the mid part of the early Cretaceous. And it's actually on my tie here. Uh, we actually had teeth of this guy from Prince George's County. So it was around here. This is Tenontosaurus. Now, as we get to the more derived members, uh, Iguanodontia, this is where that polarity of that trait totally reverses. And now instead of being wider than tall, they, the crown and the teeth are much taller than they are wide, and indeed they have this diamond shape. So the teeth of Iguanodon, like you see here, uh, have this form. These are the, the teeth, which actually don't look that much like an iguana tooth. Earlier ornithopods had teeth that looked a lot more like Iguanodon, early iguana teeth. But nevertheless, they looked enough like it that the Mantells decided to name their dinosaur Guadalajara. So we can see what forms in this part of the tree look like. Here's an Australian form, one of the most famous Australian dinosaurs, Ludoburosaurus. Uh, here's Salmoxes, a form from Transylvania, uh, appropriate for October. One of the last of uh, the dinosaurs, one of the last of the ornithopods in Europe. Sort of heavily built, very powerful jaws, actually, in this case. Here's a lightly built form from um, Western North America in the late Jurassic, Dryosaurus. Uh, here's Camptosaurus, a creature, more heavily built one, that lived as a contemporary of Dryosaurus, somewhat larger. You'll see oh, this Dryosaurus again. Here's Dryosaurus's um, East African cousin, the Solotosaurus. For a long time, it was actually considered a, a species within Dryosaurus, but it does seem to be distinct. Um, and showing about life size there, gives you a sense. Here's this Tenontosaurus, the one that was in this area, among others. And this is getting big enough, and I showed actually Captosaurus, I didn't mention it before, is also getting big enough. These things are walking at least some of the time on all fours. There's Captosaurus again, shown walking part of the time on all fours, but you can see how much bigger its hind limb is to its forelimb, so it can walk on just the hind limbs as well, maybe run just on the hind limbs. So, within Iguanodontia is a really specialized and diverse clade. And this is a group called Styracosterna. They, this is a Cretaceous group. So there were other types of ornithopods, or, or Iguanodontians, that go back into the Jurassic. Uh, Styracosternans seem to be a Cretaceous group. And in many parts of the world during the Cretaceous, they were the most important herbivores. In the early Cretaceous, it's various different branches. In the late Cretaceous, in some parts of the world, it will be one of the subgroups, the hadrosaurids. 
Styracus sternens are even bigger than the previous ornithopods. Most of these are in sort of the 7 meter to 14 meter range. 14 meters, bigger than Tyrannosaurus rex. That would include the largest individuals of Iguanodon and the largest forms of Hadrosaurid. Those are the very biggest ones. These guys get that fully developed facial hinge. And these are characterized by what I have nicknamed, one of my contributions to the field, the Swiss Army Hand. I'll explain that in a little more detail. And these forms very much are facultative bipeds. The hand has been transformed into a foot. At least part of it's been transformed into a foot, which shows that evolution uh, has been tweaking them so that because they're walking on all fours, and it makes sense, animals of this scale, you know, they could get around on just their hind limbs, but they probably habitually walked on all fours. This is Iguanodon proper, by the way. So this is a cladogram for the Styracosternans. Um, and let's take a look at some of these traits. So it's in these forms, again, huge nares, the trend that we've been seeing, and this more advanced cranial hinge that allows the lower jaws to swing outwards something somewhat more. Although the amount of that motion is probably not as extreme as we used to think back in the 80s and 90s. And there are other motions as well, like a forward, backward motion of the lower jaw, at least in dumbbells. Here's the Swiss army hand. So it's the hand of Iguanodon proper. There's the count of the digits. So one is the thumb, two pointer finger, three middle finger, four ring finger, five pinky. The pinky, as I talked about when we talked about anatomy to begin with, is opposable. Now remember, when we started with dinosaurs, they had a semi-opposable thumb. But this thumb ain't doing any opposition. And in fact, most of the non-heterodontosaurid ornithischians don't have that semi-opposability. But now we have re-evolved opposability. And in this case, the whole pinky, including the metacarpal, looks like it could swing around and touch the palm of the hand. So they could pick stuff up with the pinky. The thumb, on the other hand, has famously become a spike. So the ungual is this tall cone. The uh, other phalanx is fused to that. And they have sort of a ball and socket joint with the metacarpal. What do they use it for? <clears throat> we don't know. There's all sorts of hypotheses. One is that maybe it's for defense against the predator. And fair enough. I suspect if a predator is close enough to you and you've got a weapon, you're going to use it. However, I don't think that's the primary adaptation because that's literally a weapon of last resort. If you're close enough to stab the predator with that, it's close enough to be ripping your throat out. Um, so could it be something else? Could it be within species combat, like the uh, spurs on the feet of fowl, things like turkeys and chickens and so forth? Well, maybe. There's no evidence so far of sexual dimorphism for that, of like two morphs within the same population, a bigger one for males, smaller one for females. But maybe we'll find that eventually. Could it have been useful for prying up parts of bark. Some people have suggested that, prying up bits of bark to get into the softer wood inside of trees. Is it much on? Could be. We don't know. But they have this trait. Then when we look at metacarpals three, four, two, three, and four, so the three middle metacarpals, they're actually quite long. And honest to goodness, they look like metatarsals. And they look like metatarsals because they're functioning like metatarsals. They have become weight-bearing bones. And related to that, the unguals for two and three, and what there is of an ungul for four, is like a hoof. So their middle, the, the three middle fingers end in hooves. Although, to be fair, the ring finger doesn't have much of a hoof. It has got not much of anything. The pinky is opposable. And the thumb is a spike. So much like a Swiss Army knife that's got all those different functions, the hand of a styracosternin has all these different functions. So let's take a look at some of the styracosternins. Here's Fukuisaurus from Fukui Prefecture in Japan. Uh, here's Uranosaurus from North Africa with a very tall sail, very tall neural spines. And it lived side by side with both sauropods 
and theropod dinosaurs that also had tall neural spines. We'll talk more about that story later on. Here's Altyrhinus from Mongolia, tall nose, is what the name means, with this extremely enlarged neural region. Montellisaurus, which spent a long time being considered a species within Iguanodon, and for a while there, some people thought maybe it's actually, you know, one sex within Iguanodon, that there was strong sexual dimorphism, but now it does appear to be a separate genus that lived in the same general time and place, named after the Mantels. Here's Lurdusaurus, uh, a very heavily built one, lived in the same environment as Uranosaurus, actually. Uh, and it's got this really short metacarpus and a gigantic thumb claw, uh, really heavily built, and it has also really short metatarsals, and it sort of reminded me once of the body plan of a hippo, and so I suggested that it was perhaps semi-aquatic, like a hippo. Got no strong evidence of it, other than the limb proportions and the body proportions, but an artist decided to uh, reconstruct it doing the same. Iguanodon proper is in this part of the tree. Individuals of Iguanodon include, as I mentioned, some of the biggest ornithischians of all. So, these styracosternans outside of the hadrosaurs tend to have very broad snouts. And as I talked about before, having a big broad snout as a herbivore typically suggests a broad diet, or at least that you're cropping up a lot of vegetation at once. You're not being choosy and picky about the plant parts you're eating. Now, for at least some of these species, like Iguanodon, well, Iguanodon baronisartensis, that's a species within the genus Iguanodon. For at least some of them, there's good evidence of herding. Now, how do we know that? That's where we find multiple individuals of the same species, but different body size, buried together. And that suggests that they were in large enough groups that if they were to die together, um, they got preserved together. And even for ones where we don't have really strong evidence of herding, the existence of things like these tall sails, which probably had a display function, does certainly suggest various types of social behaviors. Additionally, having the big, the big honking snouts suggests that they were big honking snouts. That is, that as a consequence of having them, they could generate big sounds, uh, which are often used for some form of social communication. So those are the more primitive branches of Styracosterna. Just to show you a, a few of the more derived ones on the way to duckbills, here's Longusaurus. Longusaurus is a bit odd. It's, it's big. It's a big animal. I mean, you can see it compared to those uh, um, displays there. And even from a distance, you can see the individual teeth in the jaws. Over here are some of those individual teeth, and by comparison, that's the jaw, those are the tooth of a duckbill dinosaur of about the same body size. So whereas the line, the lineage that goes to duckbills is going to reduce overall tooth size as one of their primary attributes, this one didn't get the memo and decided to produce bigger teeth. And indeed, these are the largest teeth of any herbivorous dinosaur currently known. But the vast majority of lineages of advanced Syracosternin are hadrosaurids and the creatures that are closer to it, closer to that clade than to all the others. And it's actually a pretty well-documented part of dinosaur history, starting in the early Cretaceous, going up into the late Cretaceous. We see this pattern of what I call hadrosaurification, so becoming a duckbill, and it's a series of trends. For one thing, the bill, the end of the snout, becomes expanded so that we're going on our way towards a duck bill. Another trait, a decrease in overall tooth size, but an increase in the number of tooth positions. That would be the number of sockets. So we can look down here, at, over here at um, Gingosaurus or Bactrosaurus over here. And we can see relatively big teeth. But when we look at Talmatosaurus or Eolambia or Protohadros, the number of teeth are much smaller, but they have more tooth sockets. And the metacarpus is becoming longer. 
So this hand, which has been transformed into the middle part of it, has been transformed into a foot, basically. It's now become a very long and slender foot. So we can see here in Provacosaurus, these very long, slender metacarpals. Now still, at this point of the tree, they've got digit one. They still have a spike thumb. Although it's a smaller, proportionally spiked thumb than in Iguanodon or Mantellisaurus or the like. And during the mid part of the late Cretaceous, we transition from these earlier forms to honest to goodness duck bills. And as I mentioned, we actually have a pretty good record of this transition. So the true classic duck bill dinosaurs are a clade called Hadrosauridae. Now we were introduced to Hadrosaurus, or I introduced you guys to Hadrosaurus, way back in one of the first lectures when I talked about the history of dinosaur science. Hadrosaurus, remember, was discovered um, in New Jersey. It was thought to be a close relative of Iguanodon, not terribly far off. But its skull wasn't known, and it wasn't until discoveries out in the American West that we actually got the skulls of Hadrosaurids. Hadrosaurids lived, lived in the late Cretaceous. They were most common in Asia and North America, but they were actually found in many parts of the world throughout the late Cretaceous. They're typically very large. It's a 7 to 14 meters long. They were facultative bipeds. That forelimb is definitely adapted to bearing weight. But as discovered with the first hadrosaurus specimen, the hind limbs are much more powerfully developed, and they could probably walk bipedally or run bipedally if they had to. They were major herbivores where they're encountered. In fact, if you go to the late Cretaceous, the late part of the late Cretaceous in Western North America, any given geologic formation, you flip a coin. And if it comes up heads, hadrosaurids were the most common dinosaurs in the environment, and, and horned dinosaurs were the second most. And if it comes up tails, you flip it. And they're that sort of level, very comparable to each other. They're called duckbills for, well, I think you can see why. Um, Although, as we'll see, that's actually not the shape of the snout. That's the shape of the bones of the snout. And at least some of these dwelled in herds. And by herds, I don't mean collections of dozens of individuals. There are species of hadrosaurids, which are known from herds that died collectively, where we have literally thousands or tens of thousands of individuals that are known. Now, it's unlikely when we see a herd die that you lose most of the individuals in that community. It's rare that it would be more than 10% that would die in a flood event or while crossing a stream or something. So multiply those numbers by at least 10. And we're talking about animals with herd sizes comparable to bison or wildebeest or things of that nature, vast herds of animals but these are animals the size of elephants wandering across at least Western North America in this context. We haven't seen herds of quite that size found in the Asian deposits, but that may simply be a lack of the right sites. We definitely have some evidence of herding among the Asian ductiles. So here's Hadrosaurus proper as we now understand it. This New Jersey dinosaur, I mean, certainly was in our area as well. Uh, here's another Eastern North American form, Eotrachodon. And this gives us a sense of the transformation in size. So this is Camptosaurus, uh, so an early Iguanodontian. Here's the Iguanodon, and here are various duckbills over here. The largest duckbills are found in both of the major groups. So as we're going to see, there's two major groups of duckbills. So here's Shantungosaurus on the one side next to my frequent co-author, Dave Hone, who's a tall guy, he's taller than me. Uh, and you can see that this is a giant animal. It's bigger than Tyrannosaurus rex. And it's known, yeah, that's another, okay, that's an example I shouldn't have said before. That, that site is known at least from dozens of individuals of Shantungosaurus and probably more than dozens. Dozens have been found. But it's not like we just had giants in Asia and just in the non-crested forms. You have giant crested duckbills. This is Magnapolia, Big Paul, from Baja, California. We also have very big individuals of some well-known genera and species um, in collections 
Uh, for instance, Edmontosaurus inectens, the giant duck bill, the one that Tyrannosaurus would have been eating. Um, we have huge individuals of that. So here's Edmontosaurus proper. Uh, Edmontosaurus inectens, the last of the duck bills of Western North America. It's actually, this is the species for which duck bill was originally named. It was one of the first ones with a good skull, and it's one of the duckiest bills of all the duck bills. But let's take a look at the snout. A flared end of the snout, in other words, a duck bill. And notice how far back the teeth are. It's got this long space between the cropping front end of the snout and the grinding teeth way behind. That's actually a pattern we see in a lot of grazing and, and other herbivorous herd mammals today. They have toothless front ends of the snout, or maybe a few teeth, and then a space with no teeth, and then all the chewing teeth are concentrated back. So this is convergent with those. The number of tooth positions has greatly increased. And indeed, this dinosaur has more teeth in its jaws than any other one known. And all the duckbills typically have a lot. However, not all those teeth are functioning at the same time. Because the duckbills have evolved what's called a grinding dental battery. Now, a battery, um, we think of battery, we think of like electricity. Um, and the thing is, most of the time we encounter batteries, those are actually cells. Technically, a battery is a bunch of identical units functioning as a single purpose. So a car battery is a battery. It's a bunch of electric cells all right next to each other functioning to produce electricity. A, the older word, a battery was used for a battery of cannon. So you know your, your artillery would set up a bunch of cannon, and they would all go off at the same time. And that was called a battery. And that's what these are. The teeth of a duckbill function as a battery. Although it's comprised of many, 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 many separate teeth, they effectively only had four teeth. A left upper, a right upper, a left lower, a right lower. We're looking at the right lower from the tongue view. This is the medial view. And the teeth are all lunched together, locked together to form a continuous grinding surface. And new teeth are being replaced as the old ones get worn out. And you can see traced in white are the individual teeth, or the crowns of the teeth. So they had more teeth in their jaws than any other dinosaur. But functionally, it's like they had four gigantic teeth in their jaw that were always continuously at this good grinding surface. Here we are looking at it close up. We can see the lower teeth and then the upper teeth above it. And it turns out that the teeth of duckbills are the most complex in terms of structure that life has ever produced in terms of tissue types. If we look in the modern groups of animals, the most complex teeth in terms of tissue types are in bison and in horses, two groups that are evolved for a lot of chewing, a lot of grazing of resilient vegetation. And they've evolved beyond just having dentine and enamel, the two normal uh, bone uh, tooth tissues, to having a couple extra. Well, hadrosaurs have a couple more than that. They have the most complex teeth in terms of tissue types of any animal that's ever been studied. But much for the same reason that bison and other cattle and horses evolved that. The ability to grind down lots of vegetation again and again and again under this constant function. Having different materials means that the surface will always be a bit corrugated and therefore give a bit shredding surface. So here we see this cross section through a dental battery and you can see individual teeth coming out down the pathway until you get the surface that's finally used to grind the vegetation. So here's the bill view of Edmontosaurus, but this is just the bone. And along both the predentary and especially the uh, premaxillae, there would have been a horny beak. And here actually is preserved keratin in a specimen of Edmontosaurus. So actually their bills were more squared off. They were more horse-like looking in profile than duck-like. 
And older drawings just overemphasize the duckiness. But there's more to hadrosaurus than their skulls. For instance, they tend to have very long slender metacarpi, and something's missing. They don't have thumbs anymore. They lost their thumbs. So whatever that spike thumb was used for, they don't have it anymore. <laughs> they still have an opposable pinky. They still have elongate um, metacarpals and hoof-like uncles. So metacarpals, two through four, very long. And so here we see just the general pattern of transition between early ornithischians, early ornithopods, all the way up to a duckbill. Within hadrosaurids are two major clades. And so we're going to end by looking at the two major clades here. The hadrosaurines and the lambiosaurines. Hadrosaurinae and lambiosaurinae. Hadrosaurinae is sometimes referred to as saurolophinae, but in this course we're going to call it the more traditional name, hadrosaurinae. And here are representatives of the skulls of both groups. And here are representatives of the postcranial skeletons as well as skulls. So, lots of variation in them, but what makes these two groups distinct from each other? Well, hadrosaurines, the members of hadrosaurinae, have very broad snouts. These are the duckiest duckbills. The narial regions are extremely enlarged. I mean, if I went to that Edmontosaurus specimen or this Procerolophus specimen, if that had been cleared out from the sediment, I could stick my forearm through it. I mean, not in life, obviously, but as preserved. It's a big open space. And certainly I could get my hands through in Brachylophosaurus and Sorolophus there. Also, the bony end of that narial region has sort of a raised lip. And in the cases of the more specialized ones, like Edmontosaurus and Sorolophus, it's beginning to fold over. In the case of Edmontosaurus, it is folded over. And that's suggesting that that's attached to sort of a sac, that there's this sac of tissue running back from that lip. It's not a fleshy lip. A lip is like an edge, like the lip on a you know, piece of pottery or something. And just to show you examples of some of these forms. Some of these have sort of a crest, in quotes, a backwards projection of some of the uh, skull bones, but those are solid crests. And what's happening is the soft tissue that's on the front of the nares is running up on the top of the head here. So here, again, the Montasaurus, the duckiest duckbill. This is actually the specimen after which duckbills were named. Then the other, la the other clade, the last clade of ornithopods, is Lambiosaurinae, named after this genus, Lambiosaurus. And what makes these guys different? Well, notice their bills, although big, are not as flared as hadrosaurines. The main distinctive traits of the Lambiosaurines is that they have crests, but these are hollow crests on the head. It's actually the nasal chambers, so the, na the passageway for the, uh, the, the nasal passage goes way up in those bones, which are the various skull bones that have been swept back, turned around and gone back down into the throat. So to show you what that looks like, we'll take one of the simpler versions. But well, just to show you, I actually forget that. This is a recently named Platylophus from Mexico. Very beautiful skull there. Uh, shows you some of the variation in these crest forms. Here's a couple of the most famous ones, Carithosaurus, Lambiosaurus itself. Here we go, Parasaurolophus. You could see this nasal passage. So the air, if it would breathe in, would go in through the snout, way up here, turn around back, go back down that way, down into the throat, and this is a cross section through it. Note that young individuals have different shapes of crests or no crests. And there's some thought people have said about maybe sexual dimorphism. Part of the problem here is that these two forms don't co-occur with each other and are actually probably different species in different regions. But here we see a young individual and as that crest is growing throughout life. Those crests are complex. Why? Well, physiology, of course, but some of you may be in band or or uh, orchestra, and you know if you have a tube, a long tube that's twisted around, and you blow air through it, what happens? You make a sound. These things couldn't help but make distinctive sounds as air would blow through them. So although the crust probably had a display in terms of visual aspect, that's almost certainly true, 
they probably had sound displays as well. So each one would produce a distinctive sound. Now, people have actually approximated the sounds of one of those, of the, the two crested one, Parasaurolophus. It has the properties of a bassoon. Not a surprise, because it's a twisted passage, very the, about the same size as a bassoon. But we don't know what the song would be. We can only tell what the quality of the sounds would be. We see that those crests change as the individuals get older. And that does suggest that the sounds and probably the visual function was something to do with behaviors associated with adulthood. So obvious one there is courtship. Here we see a baby and an adult of the same species. OK, and just to give you a sense of the size, we're almost done. Baby Hypacrosaurus compared to an adult of the same species. All right. We actually know the babies because this is one group that we know the entire life cycle. We have the eggs. We have the babies that are found in the nests. We have partially grown individuals. We have fully grown individuals. We have literally thousands of individuals of Myasaura here. We have their nest sites. We know that they live in vast colonies, all of them nesting on the same region at the same time. And Hadrosaurids were a very successful group in their time. And indeed, some of the Hadrosaurids would have been around to see that final event that brought the age of dinosaurs to an end. OK, so that gets us through Ornithopoda. The next lecture, we'll look at the last major group of Ornithischians, the Marginocephalians. Those are the horned dinosaurs and the dome heads. So Triceratops fans, Wednesday is your day.